This is all about wine education. If you need to know more about a topic in wine, whatever it may be, you'll find it here. And if you are studying the world of wine, you'll find this exceptionally useful because it follows key text and key syllabus of major wine qualifications. This video is going to be looking at sparkling wines for the diploma WSET level four, focusing on the other sparkling wines of France. So if you have any comments or questions, we would love to hear from you. Please do get in touch about your experiences with sparkling wines other than champagne. So we will be talking about a lot of Cremant in this one, Blanquette de Lemu, and so on. Uh, series three, four, and five will go into the major other sparkling wines. That's Cremant d'Alsace, Cremant de Bourgogne, and Loire Valley. But on this series, which is just a one video, we're looking at the others outside of that list, of course. So let's look at the other sparkling wines of France. Let's talk about some terminology to begin with, and that is Cremant. So this terminology is used to denote some regional French traditional method sparkling wines, which are made outside of the famous Champagne region. So other parts of France making the same style in methodology. Now, before 1985, the term Cremant was used to refer to a semi-sparkling style within Champagne. And please be careful with the spelling. There is a, a village, a cru village in Champagne called Cremont. So there's an A instead of where the E is in Cremont. So it can get a little bit confusing. Now, the European Union banned the term method champenoise as a description of the traditional method for sparkling wines. So when this ban came in, the terminology Cremant came to be used exclusively for traditional method sparkling wines outside of the Champagne region. Now in the following decades after that, more regions created a Cremant and production grew. So I will be talking throughout this presentation about when certain regions designated a classification for Cremant in their specific location. Here are your, uh, well, here's a bit of um, cartography, a bit of map action for you, uh, outlining the eight Cremant appellations in France. So you'll see them listed on your map just here. So eight of them. The three largest and most important are Alsace, Bourgogne, and Loire. So Cremant d'Alsace, Cremant de Bourgogne, and Cremant de Loire. There are your three largest and most important. But please remember that places like the Loire also have separate appellations for sparkling, like AOC Vouvray and AOC Samur as well. So they have separate appellations, not classified as Cremant, uh, making similar styles, but a different separate classification. So they lie outside of this figure of eight stated on your slide. Now, the three major regions, Alsace, uh, Burgundy, and then also your uh, Loire, will be covered in uh, future videos, future series. But the other ones, Cremant de Bordeaux, Cremant de Die, Cremant de Jura, Cremant de Limoux, and Cremant de Savoie, will all be discussed in this presentation. So the remaining uh, ones. Now, according to what we've just talked about, they should be less important. Okay, yes, in size, but importance is an interesting word to use. There are some fabulous wines made from, of course, these, these other regions. Uh, and let's talk about our first one, which is Cremant de Bordeaux. So Cremant de Bordeaux is a relatively new Cremant classification, 
which actually dates back to 1990. Production is very small. It's about 67,000 hectolitres, uh, and four out of every five bottles is domestically sold. And I've highlighted Bordeaux down here, covers the same area. So this is really something which is quite domestic and often stays very much around areas like the southwest, including Bordeaux, of course. Now, what do you expect as the style? So the most important white varieties for Cremont de Bordeaux are Sauvignon Blanc, Sémillon, Muscadel, and also Sauvignon Gris. For the red varieties, it's what you would expect. Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Cabernet Franc. Now, because of this rather wide range of grape varieties, it's quite hard to pinpoint a, typi a, a, a typical taste of a Cremant de Bordeaux. Uh, and, and that is really because it's grape and age dependent. Uh, but I'll go through some of them. If, if you do have higher proportions of semillon, the wines tend to have a little bit more of a savoury, nutty and elegant edge to them. Sauvignon Blanc will typically bring floral and grass-like aromatics. And Merlot adds more of the kind of raspberry and red currant character. Now, white Cremant de Bordeaux can be made using red varieties as long as no skin contact occurs, whereas pink Cremant de Bordeaux must have a proportion of red grapes, of course, to give the delicate pink colour. Next up, we go to the Rhone, and that is for Cremant de D, AOC since 1993, so just a little bit after Bordeaux. And it comes from the vineyard plots along the Drôme Valley that you see on your map. It lies within the same area as Clairette de D. So we have two styles here, Cremant de D and then Clairette de D. So you have the two styles. We'll go through both of those, of course. Uh, so this area, the Drôme River Valley, is uh, not far from Valence, of course, which is uh, sort of the southern section of northern Rhone Valley. So what do we expect in a Cremant de D? Now, initially, we would find the bulk of Cremant de D being made from your middle grape on your slide, and that is Clairette. Um, and that traditionally was uh, certainly really the principal grape, uh, but we can have Allegote in the blend between 10 and 40%, and then Muscat between 5 and 10%, uh, and that's going to give um, more green elements and floral edges to the style. But there is less than 2,000 hectolitres of this produced, so much smaller than uh, the Cremon from Bordeaux, and about nine out of 10 bottles are domestically consumed within France. So this is a very rare exported expression of a traditional method sparkling wine. Then we have the Clairette de D, which is uh, a bit more prevalent. So it is a style which is quite famous around this area. And the best expressions will be labelled as clairette de di tradition. Now, Muscat must make up uh, a minimum of 75% of the blend, and then clairette will make up the remainder. So this is really the opposite of the uh, Cremant de di, which is mainly clairette, topped up with potentially some Muscat and a little bit of Allegote. So this is Muscat dominant. So, of course, the wines are going to be quite grapey. So they have a grapey character and their alcoholic strength is only at around 7 to 8% ABV. And it's used by the method Troise. And this production method actually involves a primary fermentation up to about 3% ABV in a tank. And then it goes into bottle to have a second fermentation. Unusually, 
the inherent grape sugar rather than the added sugar and yeast is what gives it the second fermentation. So nothing is, uh, is added. It is a culmination of the sugar that is in there initially. So it's that inherent grape sugar rather than anything added. No dosage is also permitted on this style as well. So these are wines that are going to have um, a distinct amount of grapiness, sweetness as well, uh, and are, are quite friendly expressions of sparkling wines. Then we go to the Crémant de Jura, uh, which was elevated to an AOC at the end of 1995. Uh, around 35,000 hectolitres are produced. Uh, so this is gaining in importance and is uh, about half the size of what's produced in Bordeaux today. Uh, and about a third are exported. So actually quite a, a typical domestic to export ratio. So you will see these wines. And of course, also in the United Kingdom, we get access to Cremant de Jura. So we count ourselves lucky, of course. Uh, now, this appellation is intrinsically linked to the Côte du Jura, uh, Arbois, which is the main city of the northern section, Chateau Chalon, which, of course, is the old castle, now a village looking majestically across towards Voiture, and then also Etoile, the star village uh, on a, a, a pentacrine star-shaped uh, hill, as well as having those pentagrin star uh, soils, uh, fossils in the soils. Uh, so what do we expect in terms of grape varieties in play? Now, the varieties are Pulsar, Pinot Noir, Trousseau, Chardonnay, and Sauvignon that are permitted, the five, the major five. Uh, for white Cremant de Jura, you have to have a, a, a minimum of 70% of Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Trousseau, okay? Uh, a small production of Trousseau uh, at only really about 10% of the vineyard land, but does craft some of the most interesting red. So you're more than likely to find the whites being mostly Chardonnay and Pinot Noir blends, not so much Trousseau. And then for pink Cremant de Jura, you must have over 50% Pinot Noir, Pulsar, and Trousseau with a significant amount of Pinot Noir. So Pinot Noir is actually fairly prevalent in Jura. Uh, it is you know, fairly significant in production, but most of it does go into actually sparkling, as you'll see from uh, being listed on this slide. What I really like about certainly the white Cremant de Jura is Chardonnay often is grown on some sort of clay or marl, and you will find the wines certainly have a distinct sort of almost nutty, very classic sort of Jura edge to it, and they can be absolutely exquisite. They're great value for money. Then we come down to the Cremant de Limoux. So this was officially recognized in 1990. Uh, it is one of the five AOC classifications in the Limoux appellation. The others belong to Blanquette de Limoux, Limoux Method Ancestral, and then Red and White Still Limoux. So it's one of the five. Located in this darker shade here on your map, just south of the fortress, medieval fortress city of Carcassonne beautiful place on the Canal de Midi, uh, quite wonderful. So what do you expect in Cremant de Limoux? So it's made up of two major grape varieties, uh, and that is Chardonnay and Chenin Blanc, interestingly, uh, which together will make up a maximum proportion of 90% of, uh, of the blend. Chenin Blanc is a minimum of 20% and a maximum of 40%, so between 20 and 40%. There are some auxiliary grape varieties for Cremant de Limoux, uh, and they are Morzac and Pinot Noir. Both of those a maximum of 20%, uh, and Pinot Noir is not allowed to exceed 10%. The annual production here is about 40,000 hectolitres, 
So quite similar to Jura, just a little bit larger. Uh, and um, just under half of that is exported. So probably about 45%, which gives you an idea that this is actually quite a successful wine outside of its domestic market. We then have Blanquette. Blanquette de Limoux is the region's most famous wine, uh, containing a blend of Morzac, Chardonnay, and Chenin Blanc. But the true speciality is Blanquette Method Ancestral, which is made exclusively from Morzac. So you'll actually see uh, this label here is the top line. It's a Blanquette de Limoux made from the Abbey of St. Hilaire, which holds the record for the oldest production of sparkling wine, dating back to 1531. That's the oldest written record of sparkling wine production. Now, the bottom one, which is the Blanc Blanquette Method Ancestral, made exclusively from Morzac, is often sweeter, often cloudy, and it has less sort of fizzy sparkles to it. It is left to ferment a second time in bottle without subsequent disgorgement of the sediment. So it's a cloudy, sweeter style. I often think it's a little bit like Moscato d'Asti from Piemonte, but not as sort of grapey floral. Then we have, oh, now all the way across to the eastern side again, we have Cremont de Savoie. This is uh, from the French Alps. It's a young appellation which actually was only awarded AOC status in 2015. And the production is tiny because it is a new, uh, a new AAC. It's only around 4,000 hectolitres. 60% of the blend must be made from the indigenous grape varieties of Jacquère and Altesse, otherwise known as Roussette, uh, and it must have a minimum of 40% Jacquère. For the remaining 40%, you'll find Chassala, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Gamay, uh, and there's a maximum of 20% black varieties. This is a really promising AOC. Uh, certainly where you get a lot of salinity because of the alpine climate conditions that one can find. Uh, just one slide to final uh, on here is the common features that we find across these Cremon wines. Now, whole bunch pressing uh, is very much important, the top left there. So hand harvested fruit, whole bunches with stems intact. So they go through the press to obtain the freshest juice. The maximum yield at pressing is 100 litres per 150 kilograms of grapes. It's a minimum of nine months aging on the lees during the second fermentation on bottle. And then a minimum 12 months maturation between tirage and release, which includes those nine months aging on the lees. A maximum ABV of 13% and a minimum of four atmospheres of pressure, of course, therefore putting it on the same comparable level as Champagne AOC. Now, while Alsace and the Loire are the largest and most important sources of traditional method wines outside of Champagne, the production of each is still only about 10% of the production of Champagne. So you really do see a dominance from the Champagne region, but there is an emerging and very interesting market with these other Cremonts. Please do join me for the other series where we go into those major expressions of Cremont d'Alsace, Cremont de Bourgogne, and also the Loire Valley Sparklings. If you do have any further comments or questions, get in touch by commenting on this video below. What's your favourite? What do you like to drink out of these Cremonts? Do you think they can compete with champagne? It would be great to hear from you. And if you do find yourself in the beautiful rolling hills of green old blighty here in the UK, come and say hello for a class, glass or bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Ciao for now. Goodbye.